Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Okay, I cannot wait for this conversation. Um, I think it's such a fascinating book. I've gotten to know you guys over the years in 50 cities around America because we've hung out in green rooms. Um, And Tony, it's always a delight when you get to join um, along for the ride. So I want to jump right in Tony, one of the things that is most fascinating to me about this book is that you're a divorce lawyer, Um, and that gives you a really unique perspective. So in addition to sharing your story in a vulnerable, authentic way, you're adding years and years of experience and expertise from the legal background to this conversation. How did that impact um, the writing, the flow, the structure, the help of this book? So, John, the impact really was profound. Uh, Without that experience working with clients, you know, having people sit across the table from me and, um, and hearing their stories and seeing what they were going through, and then even having clients come to me at the end of the day and say, this isn't what I was expecting. Uh, you know, I, I thought that, you know, X, Y, and Z would happen, but the opposite has happened, you know, and finding that um, they got to the point where um, people sometimes said, if I'd only known then what I know now, I, I would have worked harder to try to save my marriage. Mm-hmm. So, that combined with what Carrie and I went through when we we struggled for years, um, it, both of those combined to, you know, prompt me and give me the sense of urgency that, you know, there are couples out there who are like we were then, and they need help. You know, they need to see things uh, more clearly it, from that lawyer's perspective, but also from the perspective of someone who, you know, went to that really bad place and back. What are some of the things that prompted somebody to say, oh, I wish I had known that then? Like, whether it was conversations, whether it was tips, whether it was questions, you know, as you kind of survey, you know, your wide range of experience, what are some of those things that prompted that? I would say the two major things were definitely the impact on the kids and what happened with parenting. The other was the financial fallout. So, People, naturally, most people um, really struggled with taking their income, their pre-divorce income, and then dividing it over two households, because that's the reality of what happens, at least in the short term, you know, at least in the first couple of years. And, uh, And that causes strain for everyone. You know, in some cases, it's worse than others. Um, but aside from that, uh, as far as parenting goes, some people imagined, for example, that the kids would live with them most of the time. And they'd spend maybe a weekend or every other weekend with their other parent. But once the day of separation comes, well, then there's other factors that come into play. And both parents uh, sometimes realize that, well, we talked about that way back when, you know, when we were imagining what it would be like when we divorced. But now that we're actually here, that isn't what I want. You know, I want to have my kids with me as much as possible. And so it, it was those those kinds of, um, you know, in some cases, really hard, difficult, um, emotional decisions and realities um, that are compounded on top of just the the grief process that people go through when they're divorcing. Uh, it, it was it was it was all of that. I would say yeah. those were the major factors. Carrie, one of the things that I thought when I was reading this book um, was I was curious if there were sections, I'm curious about the writing process. You know, was, were you guys, because you're an author too, um, were there times where she would bring you sections? What was the 
you know, that's my first question for you. What was the creative process like for you? Because you've been on the other side a number of times writing books. What was it like watching Tony work on this? How did you collaborate together? You know, what was that process like? Because I know what it's like for my wife and I when I write a book, but I'm never the star of her book or I'm never part <laughs> of her. You had a significant role in this book. Yeah, she was writing about me. So yeah, we definitely had some moments where we had to talk about what made it into the book and what didn't make it into the book, <laughs> for sure. And it's a pretty, pretty transparent account. Like we, we had some really, really tough years. Um, and there were some things that just were trigger words for me, to be honest with you. Like uh, it did get very bad at times. And in the end, we agreed on the language that went in the book. And I think you mm -hmm. feel a hundred percent great with it. But it's funny how you think you're past something and then you read something in black and white on an edit. And I'm like, well, that's not how it happened. Like this is, <laughs> this is not us. Like, and, and so we ended up, um, I would say there were a couple of tense conversations. It was mostly a back and forth. And uh, it was a two-year process for writing. The book went through a number of drafts. It was your first, you've, you've authored scholarly publications before in law and pharmacy, so you've been published. Tony has her first book, one of her first books, John, is a really thick 700-page legal document for an update of statute law in Ontario. It's quite amazing, got really. got that on audiobook. Uh, do you really? Wow. <laughs> so. Do you? Do <laughs> A pre pre order bonus. Um, <laughs> you you use it to get. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say it didn't hit the Times list. Okay, you know what that's like, but that one didn't quite make it. Um, but <laughs> John, you use it to get to sleep at night. Yeah, I'm yeah. assuming. Uh, Canadian pillow. I uh, exactly, it's your Canadian pillow. Yeah. <laughs> Tony, chapter one to to Carrie's point about what goes in, what doesn't go in, the stories, the vulnerability. Um, chapter one opens with a really powerful scene. Like you don't waste any time. You jump right mm -hmm. in, you and Carrie are sitting in the car. And I think instantly everyone who's had this situation can understand, okay, how did I go from this to this so quickly? You're supposed to have a lunch date. It goes off the rails pretty quickly and not with a big significant blow up, but just a series of small things that have finally added up to a big thing. You take off your ring, you throw it on the floor, like sit us back in that moment. You, you know, this is kind of the middle moment, if you will, the middle of, of, of two different marriages you've had. Yeah, John, I, I remember the day clearly. I remember the situation uh, where we were in the middle of a tough season. So it's not as if I went into um, our planned lunch date, you know, expecting that it was all going to be roses and petals flying everywhere. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I was expecting that we would have a pleasant lunch and that we would be civil. We would be out in, in public and we'd make a nice conversation. And then once I, I got triggered and things sort of went from bad to worse, uh, it, yeah, I, what can I say? I, I mean, it was, it was, so I would say an epitome of the kind of chaotic um, emotional roller coaster we were on, uh, the, the, the way our differences would sometimes just blow up in the moment. So it, it was a very accurate reflection of where we were actually at when, when our marriage was rough. Well, and I, I liked that it didn't, it didn't sugarcoat and it set up that, okay, there is amazing marriages possible and there's work and there's effort, but it's possible, but it doesn't start from a, like you didn't start with a pedestal moment and then dare people to get on your level. You said, no, no, no. The car moment. I don't think this, this was in the book cause you wrote the book, not me, but you know what I was thinking in that moment? Cause it's the first time someone's asked us that question. We've done a few interviews on this, but I, I love this, but I, that was really hard. And it was one of those things in that season, date night was fight night because, you know, we had two young kids and stuff would accumulate through the week. You finally get alone. You get to talk about it. And it's like, well, I didn't like this. Well, I didn't like that. So it was like argument, not like fight, fight night, but it was it was tough. And I remember when you threw it down, it was one of those moments where I thought, oh, this could be over like it, it, this. She might actually not want to stay with me. And I remember... <laughs> It's so dumb what you remember, but I remember being crushed like it was a scene out of a movie. And I remember thinking, I sold my car to give you that ring. 
Oh, that's like, in the book. No, that's that's a hundred percent that you sold the car that your grandparents gave you. Yep. And you turned it into like a terrible car in a ring, I think, or like a like. Absolutely, you're right. It did. We've been through so many drafts, and I haven't. <laughs> we we thought we saw the actual. Fresh to me, I just you know went through it. Yeah, and it was like a 1980 AMC Concorde. If anyone's taking notes, like as a car guy, you would appreciate that. That is an obscure vehicle. But like, to me, that was all I had. So I had put all I had as a student into that. And for you to throw it down and wreck it was, in my mind, just devastating, just crushing. And yet, I was in the process of treating you in a way that you felt crushed. So it's just a ring. It's just a just a ring. Mm -hmm. And um, so we got her a new ring. But you still have that one, don't you? Oh, I still have it. It actually, it, it, I, I did, I did end up retrieving it off the floor. Yeah. Thank goodness. <laughs> well, and it's, it's interesting. Jenny and I, our first ring got lost and it was a jewelry store who's never lost a ring. They've been around for 80 years and it, they replaced it with a much better ring. And I would, for our marriage, it was like this great, okay, new chapter because we, right. you know, like any marriage had had struggles. The ring I got her was terrible. It was like <laughs> haunted. It was from a failed marriage. Like it was just no. <laughs> I had purchased it off somebody in my dad's church whose marriage failed in a spectacular way. And I uh, got a deal. And like, you got a deal. <laughs> no woman wants to hear you got a deal on the ring. And like, so Jenny, so like, oh my gosh. So we got like, we always say, like, whenever somebody's in the prosperity gospel, like, Jesus rains down emeralds. We're like, well, he did rain down a diamond on that particular situation. <laughs> it, was, it was way better. But I feel like your marriage in this book and, and in life is divided into three parts the throwaway, the messy middle, and the priceless. Like, that's how mm. I would categorize it. Um, if you had to come up with a mantra for each of those segments, what would it be? So in the, in the throwaway, maybe it was date night is fight night, or maybe it was, we're just mm. trying to get to the end of the day. Um, and in the messy middle, we're willing to fight for what matters. And in priceless, um, it turns out it was worth it. Like, what would you say was your mantra for those seasons? Oh, you want to go? Mm. That's a great question. I guess my mantra for the the throwaway version would be how does he not get this? I, I just could not understand where you were coming from, why you responded the way you did. Um, yeah. What, yeah. What would you say for that I would say season? what came to my mind was, and this is not well articulated, but can you not see how hard I'm trying? Like, that's what I would say is like, I am intending to help us here. Clearly it's not working out. Like, mm -hmm. but do you see the effort? I think I expected to be rewarded for effort. Oh yeah. And maybe using the wrong tools. Like that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. The harder you hit a screw with a hammer, it doesn't help the screw at all. You're like, you that's a really good <laughs> metaphor. I'm an Enneagram eight, you know, so pretty much is hitting a screw with a hammer. What yeah. The messy middle. So you kind of mm. have this, you know, there's this transition moment. There's this, okay, we're willing to invest in this. What is mm. what's the mantra for that moment? Or what are some takeaways from that season? Oh, yeah. I would have to say I'm not proud of this, John, but for the messy middle, I would say, my mantra was, I'm not willing to live a sham of a marriage. Yeah. I don't want a marriage that looks that. good on the outside, but you know it looks better on the outside than it does from the inside. And uh, there, were, there were seasons where we just struggled so much to get on the same page. And we, you know, we had such... Um, uh, you know, we, neither of us were willing to back down, but we both had such different opinions, different approaches, you know, it was like we were doing this. We just couldn't get to a place of, of harmony. And, uh, I mm -hmm. felt a lot of the time that, um, even though, you know, Carrie, you say you were trying, it felt like, I was undervalued, that, you know, I was never making the mark. I was always just, you know, somewhat less than, like not quite reaching that level of performance or whatever that, you know, would have brought us more happiness. And so And all that's, of that is fair. 
All that's that is what fair. I would say. Yeah, it was. Uh, I'm. I'm just not willing to live a sham of a marriage. And I, I, I love that because I think it's it's embracing honesty. It's embracing that I have value, and this thing together we can create has value if we'll create it honestly. And then on the the flip side of all that, the priceless. So you're in this other zone. You're in this other spot. You're in a spot where you love to spend time with each other. You work hard at it. You grow it. What is you know what are the mantras for the priceless? You want to go first this time? Yeah, I was going to say, just to, to throw in my bit for the messy middle, I would say my mantra, what was going through my mind is, wow, this is really terrible. We're going to make it, but I have no idea how. Like, I was committed to the marriage. I was committed to you. I was committed to solving it. I just didn't know how. And then to where we are now, it would just be like... <laughs> It's the sowing and reaping thing. Like you sow different seeds and it is later and it is greater. And, you know, I don't want to create a, hey, we never, ever disagree anymore. Yeah, we do. But like, I mean, it is, it is like a low level conflict now compared to what we went through. And I would say your emotions eventually catch up to your obedience. I've thought a lot about the season we've been in for the last decade, decade and a half. And it's like, the feelings come, they don't come back. They just get better and they go deeper. And if you just, you know, and I don't know that this is a universal thing. There are different circumstances. You know, we didn't have an affair. We didn't, we didn't have physical abuse to recover from or, you know, any of that stuff that, so I'm not saying this is a universal thing, but I'm just saying for us, it was a, a lot of obedience. Like we got to figure out how to make this work. And then, you know, your, your emotions I had hope, but I didn't have a lot of affection. And then eventually your emotions catch up to your obedience. And even being in lockdown for the better part of a year, you know, we know a lot of couples for whom this has been a lot of struggle. For us, we've had our, our moments, but oh my gosh, it's just been like, whew, do I ever have to go back on the road? Like, can we just live this way for a long time? <laughs> like it's it's good and it's rich. And I I never I would have believed that it would have been better, but I would have no idea how to emotionally access what the result of that would be in, in a positive way. Mm -hmm. I don't know. No, yeah. you can frame it in your own, own words. See, this is another thing. Old Carrie would have been like, let me tell you what to say about our marriage. <laughs> New Carrie is like, you just say what you want to say. That That's true. That was oh, a yeah. problem. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. Um, I would say mantra for the priceless version now. Um, I, it's hard to put into words, actually. I, I just think I'm living a marriage that way exceeds what I ever would have expected. The, you know, the dreams mm. on my on my wedding day uh, fall short of what we're actually living out right now. And I can hardly believe it. It's, I, I am truly, um, sincerely grateful every day um, for what we've, you know, for the relationship the way it is right now and um, the way God brought us through it. Wedding day dreams are so naive though, right? Like, oh, they are. Like you, don't, you, you don't really oh know. Oh my gosh. You don't know what to expect, but I never would have expected that our relationship would be this rich and um you know we would be this close and having this much fun and actually be able to spend like endless amounts of time Seemingly together endless yeah and we we're having fun all the time like it, well, we actually have not been able to um exhaust our ability to spend time together yeah in it's this like season. it's 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 great and the other thing is i think we emerged as as one but as two distinct individuals it's not mm -hmm. like some mind meld where now you agree with everything and i mm -hmm. agree with everything no you are one of the things that i think made this work is you know i'm an 8 you're a 5 on the enneagram but you have a steel spine like oh my goodness like you you have convictions and beliefs and i think i'm in a place where i respect them more than i'm trying to change them mm -hmm. That's that's been massively different. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, I think there I think part of what we did really struggle with in the the throwaway version, the messy middle, was um 
that you, you do have a tendency to be controlling. And I mm-hmm. think in my own ways, oh, yeah. I do too. And mm. we were we were just in this power struggle, like <laughs> went on for a long time. I guess we both lost. <laughs> <laughs> right. Maybe we both lost. <laughs> That's funny. So Carrie, you've touched on this a little bit. We, you know, we're on the, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, Tony, what have you seen that do to marriages? You're a divorce lawyer. Um, mm. I mean, I, I'm, I can't imagine that your answer is going to be like, it's been amazing. It's like one long vitamin. Like everybody <laughs> love each other. It's so many tickle fights. Um, but from your perspective as someone who's seen, you know, trends in divorce, changes in marriages, all, you know, you've got this, again, big kind of book to pull from. What do you think is happening for marriages in the pandemic? Stats wise, uh, the jury is out on what's happening. Um, there were there are reports saying that the divorce rate is actually increasing. Um, there are some conflicting reports as well. So I think time will tell what you know what the actual divorce impact is. But what seems to be happening relationally this year in marriages is that marriages that are okay you know, where the, where there's been more space and less distraction, less activity, some of those have been, at, been getting better. Um, mm-hmm. That it was almost like there was a, a, a pressure valve that was released, you know, some of the steam uh, released out of the system and, and people have found a way to grow closer. Um, on the other hand, uh, where there was already tension and maybe the schedule was helping people avoid it, deny it. You know, there's all kinds of activity going on. We can play nice when we're in the sandbox for a short time. <laughs> uh, that in in those cases, being in close quarters and having fewer um, activities to attend has actually made it worse and has brought just brought those tensions um, more to the forefront, maybe, you know, aggravated some of the um, emotional responses people are having to to their conflict because you just don't have as many escapes. So I think we've almost seen a, a, a polarization, I believe, you know, where some okay marriages are getting better, but shaky marriages are really struggling. Yeah. And we have seen statistical evidence that alcoholism has gone up. Alcohol consumption, drug mm. use is hitting some highs. Mental health seems to be at a historic shaky point. And the metaphor I heard, I don't know whether um, you've heard this, John, but I I really like this metaphor that what happened during the pandemic, it's like the lake was drained and you finally see what's at the bottom. And you're like, oh, I didn't know that was there. And so you didn't really have to deal with it, but now you got to deal with it. And I think you either find a pleasant bottom or, or, you know, it's like, wow, there's some stuff there that Mm. we got to, we got to deal with. A lot Um, of garbage that has mm -hmm. to be hauled out. Yeah. (laughs) Really interesting way to think about it. I'm curious how do you think a marriage rebuilds before it has to completely hit rock bottom? Like I, I would love to have marriages not, you know, it kind of reminds me of conversations I've had with Carrie over the years about, do you have to burn out before you can rebuild? Like, is yeah. that? so how do you, you know, maybe I'm listening to this and I'm, I'm in an uh, average marriage. It's not happy. Like it's headed to a place like marriages are always in motion and they're headed to good places or bad places. So How do you, you know, if you've got a spouse that says, okay, I don't want to need rock bottom to rebuild, what are some steps? Hmm. I would say number one is related to this tendency that we all have to try to point the finger when we're struggling. So uh, I saw this over and over, not only between us, but also once I was in practice, it really stood out as a trend that almost every person I talked to believed that their spouse was mainly the one to blame for the depth of their problems. Says that, every spouse yeah. ever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If, if, if only he would start stop doing X or she would stop doing whatever it is she does, you know, then things would turn around and it would be so much better. And it's this victim story. I call it a victim narrative that, uh, you know, because it's mostly your fault, that means that I've got this assumption going on in the background that, that I'm a victim of whatever that weakness is. And I don't mean weak, I don't mean victim in the sense that there's a safety issue or, you know, that there's something truly harmful about this. I just, 
mean, you know, in the in the context of an unhappy marriage where both people hold complaints against each other, that victim story is like putting on glasses that aren't yours. You know, if you've got the wrong prescription glasses, all you can see are blurry images. And uh, when when you have that victim story going on in the background, it really does clear your vision about what's going on. So there's, there, you know, when there's deep struggle, when, when things are already tense, um, the reality is that it's not unidimensional. And in the vast majority of cases, it's also not your spouse's fault. Mm-hmm. That there has got to be some part of it that that is your own personal responsibility, but because of this victim story, uh, you're not seeing it. What and are the so, that people can own like if they want to snap out of the victim. So, you know, okay, I don't want to say it's it's this person's fault because there's a chance. It's kind of I always j- talk about how up to eighty percent of people who move to Hawaii from mainland U.S. move back within the first year. Because the problems they had in Ohio followed them magically to Kona. Totally, 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 totally. <laughs> and they don't remember packing those insecurities in Ohio, but lo and behold, they're there. So you could, if you don't deal with the things, the fifth marriage, the sixth marriage, the seventh marriage, like it's not gonna, it's not gonna fix it. What yeah. are some things that if I said to you today, okay, I hear that, I believe that, I want to own some things I can own. What can I own? Yeah, and that's a matter of personal reflection. I mean, you you really have to be committed to uh, looking at yourself, standing back, ditching that victim story, and ditching the assumption that it's my spouse's fault, and and starting to look for okay, here's the circumstance. What part of it is? What part of it am I contributing to? Even if it's only you know. 5% or 10% in your own estimation. You know, I, I think that um, my tendency to withdraw, you know, yeah. maybe accounts for 10% of our problems, but the other 90% is Carrie's aggressiveness and, you know, he won't give me, give me space. My glasses. <laughs> yeah. It's my glasses. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, so dark. <laughs> But it's it's ninety percent his fault. But but what you know, even if I'm off in my probably misguided estimation of how much of the problem I own or am responsible for, if I will at least start to work on my part of it, if I can admit that, okay, so my withdrawing from the conversation, the argument we need to have, or the you know the the forum where we're dealing with our differences. If my withdrawing is causing a problem, what do I need to do so I can engage? You know, and and what do I need to? What what strategies or skills do I need so that I can uh, can stay and be rational when we have this conversation. So, you know, there's a whole lot of, uh, of self-awareness that, um, that really does come into play in personal growth, you know, in being able to make progress, you know, make mm-hmm. personal progress. Yeah, I would say just to put, put some, an example into that from my end, it was definitely a lot of blame and uh, in, in the conflict spiral in our marriage. But like one of the things, and you talk about this in the book, like I am undiagnosed, but self-diagnosed OCD. Like there are certain things, not the compulsive part, but just the obsessive, like the lawn has to be cut. And, you know, Instagram. the yeah. car. Yeah, my Instagram. If you follow me on Instagram, <laughs> your lawn. this has not gone away. Okay, <laughs> this has not gone away. So I have to drive a clean car. I have to have like, look, look at my office, John. Like it has to be. Oh, like, don't look in the, yeah, in the drawer. Kind of okay. Canadian spider back there. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm, I'm that way. And that was a source of conflict, particularly when the kids were little, because Tony is more relationship driven and I'm more task driven. And if, if I, I think for a living, right, pray, think, whatever. Um, if my environment is out of order, I'm out of order. That's just the way I'm wired. But where it would show up in our marriage is I would be like, I got to go cut the grass. And Tony's thinking, no, you don't, you idiot. You got to look after your sons or you got to, you know, help with dinner or whatever. But in my mind, it was like, no, can't you see objectively like the lawn needs to be cut? And it's really Mm -hmm. stupid looking back on it. But in my mind, I was fully convinced that you just didn't understand. 
And then I realized through a lot of counseling, reflection, prayer, all that stuff, it's like, oh, wait a minute, I'm actually crazy. Okay, now I get it. Okay, <laughs> I am like, this is not normal. And you are actually nor you, you know, you're you're giving a reasonable reaction that the lawn doesn't actually need to be cut. Now I mm-hmm. still go out and cut my grass, but it's not a source of conflict because I can own that. Oh, I'm actually crazy. Um, this is something I do because it makes me feel good, but it's not objectively necessary. And we just don't argue about it anymore because I make sure that, you know, our kids are older now, but you know, if they're around, I'm going to focus on them. We've got our time in. And then if I want to spend my spare time cutting my lawn obsessively, that's up to me. But that was, that was a big pivot. Does that make sense, John? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think, I think what's interesting too is you guys have, you know, we've talked about some of the spiral stuff, some of the messy stuff, but I'd love to talk about some of the the priceless stuff. I think you guys do a really good job with what I would call connection habits. Like, so habits that connect you. So they can be, we kayak together. We do this together. What are some things that you've said, you know what? First 15 years, we didn't do this. And sometimes it can be, we went to bed at different times and that was a disconnection habit. Yeah. We did, mm-hmm. you know, so what in this season, in the, the joy-filled season, have been some deliberate connection habits? That's a great question. John, can I just tie this into the question you asked me before about, you know, what people can do to pre- prevent getting to that rock bottom place? Um, and one of them is has to do with just being there for each other's emotions. Yeah. So in terms of, of connection, you are going to build a closer connection with your spouse if you can accept and validate their emotions and not dismiss, not, you know, brush over them or try to control them. I think in the, in the early days, we really got tripped up because we would have a tendency to either like dismiss each other's emotions or, you know, it's not logical for you to feel blah, blah, blah. You have to or, validate my know, lawn yes. emotions. <laughs> you know, don't feel that way. Well, those are, are, terrible emotional intelligence strategies um, to to treat each other's emotions that way. So just, you know, being able to let each other have our authentic emotions and and even notice them. So if Carrie's venting, you know, I don't jump into problem solving mode um, to say, you know, oh, that's a terrible problem. You should blah, blah, blah. Did you blah, blah, blah. That it doesn't help because I'm not actually acknowledging his emotions. And, um, you know, it reminds me of, uh, of a talk that uh, I heard when I was earlier in my career. And um, stupid me, I didn't put two and two together when I heard it. But this doctor was coaching other physicians on how to build a bond with their patients. Because, you know, they had um, brilliant work ethics and brilliant treatments. But the problem was they were oncologists. And when they delivered a diagnosis and their patient, you know, started crying um, as they would, uh, they would go on and explain how the treatment would go, but their patient would perceive them as being completely cold because they didn't acknowledge their emotion. And just to mm. to stop and sit with your with your partner when they're, you know, going through uh, some tough emotions and say, wow, that sucks. That mm. was, sounds like, you know, I'd be angry too if I were in your shoes. And, and being able to sit with and validate each other's emotions, it just brings you closer. So it's one thing that, that we do now um, far more instinctively, but, but we were really getting it wrong in the early days. Did either of you guys grow up with the belief that you didn't have access to certain emotions or certain feelings? Like that certain- Oh, 100%. Yeah. Well, yeah. Which yeah. ones? I mean, you're, you're both Christian. So anger obviously is of the devil. So, I mean, correct. That, like, yeah. Yeah. I would you say, go. yeah, it's a, it's a really, really good point. I mean, I came into adulthood and I was basically either happy or angry. Those were the two emotions that I could two access. Speeds. What's that? Yeah. Two speeds, angry, two speeds, happy or angry. Yeah. And generally, as long as you didn't get in my way, I was, I was happy. And then I got married. So you know, that was, that was a disruption, but yeah, I would say I was not very in tune. I can't exactly trace it out to how it happened. Although I have thought about this, but I felt like, yeah, 
I wasn't good at feeling like if I was angry about something, it's like, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Like, it's going to be fine. It's like, but it's not okay. Like, it's not okay. But I felt like I didn't have permission to talk about it being not okay or being upset. Or, you know, that thing parents do where cheer up. It's like, but I don't feel cheery, you know? Somebody and so I've- worse than you. That never is helpful. Like, no, point no. Out somebody mm. else's deeper misery. That just makes you feel more ashamed for yours. Exactly. Yes. And so I did not know. I didn't understand my emotions at all. Could you say um, to, could you say to Tony, I feel sad? No. All right. No. Cause that one, I think a lot of men, like a friend of mine, like a year ago, we had a coffee and said, I feel really sad about something. I was like, Whoa, are we, we get to say that you one know, huh. now? Yes. Actually, you know, as, as we're doing this interview, I have stepped back from the church and uh, from a couple of weeks, like sort of retired, finished the succession plan. I'm like texting some friends who have done a similar thing, at, you know, and I did it fairly early compared to most leaders, but I'm like, there's just this sadness that comes in waves. And now, I, I, I mean, I said that to you, we talked mm-hmm. about it at dinner. Yeah. I'm like, I just feel sad today. You need to know, like, I don't know why there's nothing wrong. You didn't do anything. Nobody did anything. I just mm-hmm. feel sad. And you were like, okay. But you talked to a 32 year old Carrie and I would have been like, hey, how come the kitchen isn't cleaned up or, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. It would have come out pathologically in a, in a very different way. And now I'm like, mm-hmm. I think I'm sad. That's naming your emotions. And I don't know why. And that's OK. And this too will pass. And it does, as you know. What about you, Tone? Emotions you could or could not express. Oh, well, I think it, it was complicated for me because I, uh, I I did go through some trauma in my childhood, you know, in my family of origin. Uh, my my dad had a problem with anger, and so anger was one of the emotions that I could not express. I could not. It was too potentially volatile. It, it was actually not safe, and uh, so anger was really almost out of the question. But the thing is, you know, when you have that kind of trauma response, the anger eventually just ends up leaking out. Correct. And, and, and that, that is, that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you need a witness. Uh huh. <laughs> Blows out the sides. So Tony, yeah. what, so I, I think it's, it's interesting to think about that. Okay. You don't get to express anger or it's not safe. So if I'm a wife listening to this and, you know, or if I'm a, a husband listening to this and I, I want to have a better marriage, I'm encouraged by this, I want to read the book, I want to engage in the book, but I don't have a spouse that will go to counseling or I don't have a spouse that will meet me in the middle or I, you know, like we all know they're like subtly sliding a book about anger onto your husband's nightstand and be like, oh, I saw somebody <laughs> talk about this, reminded me of somebody I sleep next to, like, <laughs> what do you do in those moments? Like if you're the spouse and you're willing to change and you feel like your partner isn't like, what is, you know, how do you walk somebody through that? I'm a firm believer that there's so much progress that you can make, even if your partner won't go to counseling. So, uh, and, and we actually started out that way. I yeah, went, I, I went to, to counseling before you Carrie would join in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I just, I'd seen enough of, um, you know, I had some, I, I, I saw some clues of the trauma that I really wasn't aware of. So I've, you know, I had this tendency to dissociate. I, I would also, you know, tend to be triggered and, you know, Carrie could provoke me at a, at a level three, but I'd respond at a level 10, like, you know, in a flash. So I could see from from those clues that there was something else going on and I wanted to know what it was. So, uh, so going to counseling, just, it, it helped us both because, you yeah. know, once I've got more insight, once, once I start to develop some more self-awareness, then it, it changes things. It shifts things. And it was a long, slow path for us, but, but, I, I would say to the person whose spouse really isn't on the same page, um, go and get some counseling. You know, get insights that are helpful. You know, from a self awareness perspective, such as Enneagram. You know, mm. read the road back to you and identify a couple of ways that. Uh, one thing I like about the road back to you is that it shows you what you can do for your own growth journey. 
you know, take one or two of those and take those steps and see what kind of an influence it has. And, uh, and, and I would also say if there are ways that you can show, you know, genuine kindness, love to your partner, even if you know each other's love languages, mm. just being able to, you know, for me, it would, if I'm trying to uh, <clears throat> grow closer to Carrie or make some progress between us, acts I of know service, that acts, acts of, of service, service, acts of service are the <laughs> ticket. <laughs> you want quality time. Yeah. I want acts of service. It's yeah. like, yeah, they compete. That's mm-hmm. funny. That's that's funny. Yeah, and if you don't know them, you can't serve them, and then you push harder in the wrong direction, thinking you're making it, it, progress. Exactly. Yeah, I, I would say, John, too, if I can just chime in real quick on that one. Um, I was a resistor. If you had asked me this question 20 years ago, I would have said, yeah, 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 John, great, great, great. But you don't understand. <laughs> it's Tony. Like, the way <laughs> she's, like, shutting down on me, and she gets so angry, and this and that, and like you, if you saw her and experienced her the way I did, then you would be as upset as I would be. And I don't know that that I would have listened, but I, what I've learned in this journey and having sat from a different perspective with a lot of couples in trouble over the years is, yeah, you kind of go with you wherever you go. As you know, you said, those people who moved to Hawaii is like, whoops, took myself there. Now I got problems. And um, that is great incentive to me as a leader. I've learned that in leading teams. I've learned that in leading children. I've learned that in being married to Tony. Like, oh yeah, I'm kind of left with me. And, you know, my own prayer life and confession, it's like, oh, I seem to be the root of all the problems in my life. And so I would say that is something. There, Everything in your body. I remember the first time I did go to counseling and it was about an hour north of here. And mm. um you were saying you have to go, like, this is not doable. And I was like, no, I send people to counseling. I'm not going to counseling. And it was to see a friend that we both respected, a a colleague who's older. And I remember it taking every ounce of strength and will and resolve I had in my body to get out of the car, to swallow my pride, to walk through the door of that little country church where he did his counseling and to go in. And even then I spent the first hour explaining how I wasn't the problem and how Tony was the problem. And then he said, so let's talk about you. And it was one of the best things I've ever done. And it launched a multi-decade journey into really where, where we're at today, but that is excruciatingly difficult. So I just want to, you know, speak to the leader who's listening, who's like, yeah, but you don't understand. It's my spouse. It's like, hmm. Let's not the start there. I think it's I yeah. Think it's a, there is a resistance. Pressfield to say, yeah, I wanted to. I didn't want to go. Like I was for, like, you know, like when I've done counseling or started new counseling relationships, the drive there is excruciating because you're like, I can't believe I'm doing this. Like it's getting on a roller coaster. Because <sighs> why am I still so messed up? How come I haven't got this figured out? Exactly, and it's going to lead places you don't expect. So and and so I th- I love that you're changing that expectation of no. I just walked in and I was like, I'm here to workshop my problems. Like because that's not the reality. <laughs> And expectation is a word I want to ask you about, Tony. Hmm. You talk about expectations a lot in the book um, about, you know, what does a wife expect? What does a husband expect? You know, I feel like culture does marriages significant damage by creating expectations that aren't true, that aren't realistic. What would you say is one of the best representations of marriage and one of the worst representations of marriage in a movie? So an example of, (laughs) oh, when I saw this, I was like, that is the dumbest thing ever. Or when I saw this, I thought that's a real picture of what a real marriage looks like. What a what a uh, lighthouse for other people. Wow. Well, the first one that comes to mm-hmm. mind on the picture of this is a terrible picture of marriage, and I, I'm not sure whether everybody's going to get this or not, John. Um, so you guys might need to help me brainstorm here. But leave mm-hmm. it to Beaver. Oh, you know gosh. the the cleavers. It goes back a while. Um, yeah. I, I've actually, I, I've actually known. I don't remember the cleavers. Cle- I think they did. Yeah. <laughs> and they never kissed only on the cheek, only on the cheek. Oh, mouths were filthy in the fifties. Just <laughs> cooties, cooties all in that mouth. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, but it was just this, you know, pristine environment and everything's calm and peaceful and yes, dear. And yes, honey. And, uh, you know, it, it's just not a realistic picture mm. of what a real relationship is like. There were, there weren't, you know, disagreements and everything ends with a 
laugh. And I, I've had couples, um, I, I've known a couple actually who had this leave it to beaver picture of marriage in their mind and their own marriage was such a, a crushing distance from that that they couldn't handle it and they actually left they just said, obviously, I've made a big mistake, and and that was it early on in the marriage. Uh, so I would say, you know, that um, definite, you know, male, female roles defined, everything's peaceful, everything's orderly, uh, nobody has a real disagreement picture of marriage is, it's just not a reality, at least in a healthy marriage. Yeah. I mean, finding a good one's hard. Like, the flip it side is. of that is, I mean, can you think of a single time when you were like, oh my gosh, that, I mean, I'm, I know there are, but I just, it's easier for, for us to find the, I think, I think the modern equivalent of leave it to beaver, which I totally agree with tone is Instagram. I mean, you know, you follow, mm. you follow people and it's like, man, you look so manicured and there's face filters on everything. You got the perfect romantic shot. And like, you know, you, I'm not, I'm not criticizing, but like you hired a photographer for the engagement pick and the wedding is on some mountaintop or whatever. And, you know, you're in this like unrealistic. Keller has a really, Keller referenced someone, I think it's a Jewish theologian who said, with the death of God in our culture, we have now taken all the expectations that we had, we used to look to God for, and we place them on our spouse. In other words, mm -hmm. you have to fulfill me. You have to be everything. You're actually, because we don't know about eternity, you have to be as perfect as eternity. And you have to be as, as loving and forgiving. And it's like, that is just, crushing. And so I see that. And I think a realistic picture, I haven't seen the whole series, but I've seen enough of it. Maybe this is us, like stuff that's just real, real honest day-to-day -day, um, small things. And what was that? What was that uh, uh, Rashida Jones and Bill Murray movie we saw? I forget movies because I sleep through half of them. On the Rocks. <laughs> that was like... That, that was good. It's an Apple TV thing, but uh, it was actually good. Bill Murray and Rashida Jones on the rocks. I thought that was a, uh, I stayed awake for most of that. So mm -hmm. uh, I think that was a fairly accurate, would you agree or disagree? Yeah, yeah, no, I, I would agree. And I, I think the picture, the picture is that, um, that it's a, it's a team approach where you are both looking to support each other's goals, aspirations, mm -hmm. you know, and, and the things that have to happen around the home, you know, you're talking about what are each other's strengths? You know, how can we divide this up so that it makes sense for both of us? And, uh, you know, what is it, what, what is your, uh, what do you feel is your purpose and your unique wiring, you know, how your wiring meets the need of the world, you know, what is that? And we're both asking that question. And then practically speaking, how can we make it work? You know, there, there's, yeah. I think we need to get away from this concept that someone needs to stay home and look after the kids and someone else needs to be liberated to go out there and, and, you know, fulfill a calling or be the breadwinner or whatever that is. I think the closer concept is a team approach. Now it's still in that team approach, you may very well make the decision that one person is going to stay at home and raise mm -hmm. the kids and the other one is primarily going to be um, running a business or whatever that is. But it's been a, a joint decision. <clears throat> you don't have one person making the decision, calling the shots, or finding yourselves in slots that maybe your family culture has defined, or your church has defined, or your, you know, whatever community you've come from has assigned certain roles. I, I don't yeah. see that as being a, as fulfilling a way to live out a marriage. And as you're talking about that, I, I don't know whether you'd agree with this or not, because we haven't talked about it. I would say, you know, the beginning, middle, end, or end, or current phase, hopefully it's not the end. <laughs> but, but, but real dark. That was, that was really interesting. Um, no, but, but beginning, middle, current. Uh, at the beginning, I would say we were two individuals. And I mean, hey, two law school grads, like they teach that. I mean, you are like an individual and this whole idea of, of the two becoming one would just be like absolutely foreign to that, that school of thought. But I think we were two individuals who were trying to get the other to conform to their image. And now we're in a phase where I would say, yeah, as far as teamwork goes, yeah, it's like we complement each other. Uh, you bring stuff to the relationship I don't. Um, we share values. We've worked really, really hard on our values and our principles. 
And so we agree on those and that makes everything else easier. But, you know, it really is like, you know, John, when, when our kids, they left, we became empty nesters in our forties and like, there is a lot of time left. I thought we'd be old and dead by the time our kids left. And then you're like, oh my gosh, like we, we may have more time just because we had our kids when we were in our twenties, we may have more time without our kids living at home than we had with our kids living at home. And that's a whole lot of each other. So we better get each other right. Cause this, this is going to be like decades of this and we might actually be in good health. Like we could do things together. You became empty nesters. Uh, let's see. Oh nine. So I was 44 when our oldest left 44. and I was 49 when our youngest left. 44 to 49. That's, that's crazy. I know mm-hmm. it's nuts. Now I know people are having their kids later, but I'll be 56 this year. And like, honestly, I feel better than when I was 36. I'm in better shape. Uh, mentally, you know, I think I'm probably a little bit sharper, I hope, than when I was in my 30s. And and we look forward to, God willing, a couple decades of adventure and making a dent in the universe somehow together. Like th- there's decades ahead, dude, mm-hmm. God willing, which is nuts. I love that. I love that. One of the, um, one of my favorite stories in the book, um, because I didn't see the twist coming, was when you go to a party, Tony, it's a friend's party. You're excited. It's catered. There's like, it's amazing. I think everybody's wearing like top hats and tuxedos. That's how I interpreted it. And you're there and the night isn't over yet. And Carrie's like, all right, it's a wrap. I'm out of here. I'm gonna That's go- me every <laughs> party and every night. So I'm gonna go especially a- if there's dancing. Yeah. I'm going to go change a light fixture at home. Like, and <laughs> at first I was like, this is crazy. Like, Carrie, well, one, I was like, I get that. Like I, I tweeted once. One of my favorite things is to leave things early. And uh, just, it is such a subtle joy. But I was like, oh, no, Carrie, what are you doing? But he left for a completely different reason. I thought it was a really great example of misreading um, each other's actions, misreading each other's intentions. So can you tell that, tell that story? Sure. Yeah, it, uh, I remember the party well. It was a big milestone birthday for close friends of ours. And so uh, she really had pulled out all the stops yeah. in planning this party. Like, you're not exaggerating it the way you set it up. It was beautiful in every way. And um, she even hired like live dance instructors to come in to the party to teach the guests live, you know, how to do belly dancing or whatever that was. Well, I want to believe <laughs> and and we weren't even that far into the party. Like, I don't even think they had served dinner yet. We were maybe just an hour into it. And Carrie said, uh, I'm going to head out now. And, oh, you were mad. and I, at first, <laughs> so I went through stages. <laughs> at first it was shock. And, and then it was, and then quickly it was just anger. Like, what do you mean? You know, we don't have too many of these opportunities. This is our fifth Not, gala. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And our kids were young. So, I mean, these aren't every night, right? Like mm. this was a rare chance. So, yeah. So, mm. um, so I just was overtaken by that anger that, you know, how could you dare leave this party, you know, and and leave me here and expect me to just be happy and keep on dancing. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Oh yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But the reason was completely different. Uh Uh-huh. I oh, had yes. to leave for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. So so we left. I was I was triggered, you know, in the in the car. I'm sure you could have heard me from the outside with the windows mm-hmm. <laughs> windows up. rolled up. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was not pretty. And um and and I was uh, I was angry to the point where and for a, a long enough time that finally Carrie, you had to tell me. Yeah, she was why. getting angrier and angrier. You go ahead and tell it. Well, it, I mean, I, there was just no. Uh, Carrie couldn't explain to me if I wanted why, to live. <laughs> why he would leave this party and bail on date night, and it just it didn't make any sense to me. And on top of the frustrations that we'd already been experiencing in our marriage, it was just like the straw that broke the camel's back. So yeah. finally, we got to the point. Where where Carrie had to say, Tony, I had to leave the party because we've got 50 people coming over to our house for a party for you. Tomorrow morning. (laughs) And I got to get ready, okay? So I'm sorry. It was a surprise. I had people coming in from hours and like childhood friends and friends from Toronto 
who are all coming to surprise her for your birthday, your 40th. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And I didn't know how I was going to live through the night if, if that kept going. Just say it. But you know what's mm-hmm. interesting, John, about expectations now? And I hadn't thought about this. And I, I remember that story being in the book. Again, if you know publishing, it was a year ago that it went to the publisher, blah, 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 blah. So we're going to get a copy soon. But if that, see if you agree with this. If that scenario played out today, because you still love to stay late and I still love to, to leave early. That's mm-hmm. just me. That's yep, going to be a I'm dynamic for the rest we'll of our lives. together. Life. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I like to tip out early and I like to go to bed on time and I'm like, okay, this is enough. Put me with my five friends in the corner and then I'm going to leave. And anyway, so that's just it. But I think if that happened today, what happened, John, which was so interesting because it reveals, it's like that the lake drain and you see what's at the bottom. When you have a moment like that, it was a whole lot of me leaving for the wrong reason. It was a whole lot of unresolved frustration that was there all those years ago. And now I think if that happened, and I really was, which I'm not, planning a surprise party for you, and I'm like, honey, <clears throat> you know, we need to go or whatever, you would give me the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, and, I think and, that's true. And you would be like, really? And I'm like, can you just trust me on this one? Like, I really need to go. And you'd go like, okay. And it wouldn't turn into a meltdown. And the same mm-hmm. would be the case for you. If you're like, hey, we, mm-hmm. I know you've been looking forward to this. We got to duck out. I would just say, and you, you would, on the way home, I think it would be like, well, why? Mm-hmm. And I would be like, I just can't tell you. Can you trust me on this? And you'd be like, okay. And I would be mm-hmm. the same. Is that yeah, fair? Yeah. No, I, I think at that stage, trust was a real issue yeah. between us. And, and we didn't have that sense that we had each other's backs in, <laughs> in that day, even though we, it wasn't that we weren't trying. It wasn't that we you know didn't have good intentions. It's just that there was so much bad blood from all the unresolved uh, junk that had been going on between us that we just, you know, and, didn't and fully trust was, each other. Because I'm not good at lying. My it's excuse was, picture. what's that? Wasn't it to fix a light fixture? Yeah, fix a light <laughs> fixture. And I think I may have also told you, and I have to clean the place up, which was a trigger for you because I was obsessed with environment. Now it was actually had obsessed a reason to clean the place up <laughs> this time because we are having 50 of your closest friends show up tomorrow. But yeah, it, it was it was one of those things. And it, yeah, I'm just, I think you're right. That was part mm, of the trigger. It was like, yeah. you're going home to clean. <laughs> I think that part of the reality too, if I can just throw this in there, I think now, if that happened now, you wouldn't have waited until the moment to tell her you wanted to leave early. You would have set expectations together as a couple and said, hey, you know, I'm not a huge, like, I don't want to stay till midnight. Like, I'd love totally. to leave. I'd love to leave yes. at 930. And, and Tony, you would get to express the desire and have a voice and go, well, I'd really like to stay until these moments. So I'm going to get a ride with a friend. I'll, I'll be home at 1130. And Carrie, you wouldn't have gone home feeling guilty for leaving. And Tony, you wouldn't have stayed feeling mad. Carrie left. And then when you got home, you would have talked about, oh, that's great. What'd you do with the, like, how was the party? Yes. You that's, would have had yes. room to be your own whole people with whole desires that work in a unit. No, you know what? You yes. totally, you totally nailed that one because that is exactly what we have done over the last few years. If there's mm-hmm. going to be an event and you're like, I want to stay late. And I'm like, I got legit reasons to be home. We'll take separate cars or get a friend to drive you home or that kind of thing. You still love each other. And you're not sitting there going, all these people think we have a bad marriage because I'm the only one here. And he's like, none yes. of that is is in the conversations. And you haven't got the digs. Like, like you know, when we go out now, uh, how many social events were ruined in the early years? Because there was, you know, you kind of put your happy face on when you leave the car, but there's all this like simmering, like oh, yeah. and people angst and like, yeah, yeah, people can tell. Yeah. And, and sarcasm and yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that little sideways mm-hmm. jab. He'll want to leave early, you know? And yeah, it's like, she'll want to stay forever. Like she's so irresponsible, you know, all those little jabs. And, and now I don't know. It's been a long time. It's been a while. Okay, so we're almost at the end of this. Tony, what's your hope for the book? What's your, mm-hmm. you know, I, you know, people are listening Carrie has a massive audience. There's leaders, there's spouses, there's single adults. What's your what's your hope for the book? I hope there will be struggling couples who uh, read through it, take a step back, and really think about how they might give their marriage a second try. And identify maybe just one step that might help solve a problem that you haven't been able to solve so far. I think that would be my, my hope. 
Carrie, what was your what was the your proudest moment of watching Tony go through this journey with the book? Because it's awesome. It's awesome to see, you know, a spouse do something like that. Oh, yeah. You know, watch her work so hard uh, over the last three years, three iterations of this book, three like substantially different drafts, not having the confidence, if I can say it, that you would be able to do it. And Mm -hmm. then to see you doing this to get a publishing deal to go through the launch, you know, all stuff that you've watched. I, I, I'm at the point, John, where I'm like, if I just get to carry your suitcase for the rest of my life, I'm going to be the happiest <laughs> husband in the world. So I'm just so that's proud of Tony. <laughs> no, I think that's going to be it. You're going to hit the list. You know, it's going to be amazing. And I'll, 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 I'll get to carry your luggage. And uh, I'm just really, really proud of Tony and uh, really proud of the message that this is a passion point for you. And we're just hoping that a lot of other couples uh, hopefully discover what we've been able to discover. It's not easy, but it's worth it. I I love that. Well, Tony, thank you so much for writing this book. Thank you for letting me be part of the conversation. Um, There's a million people that could have done this interview. Carrie, you've had a billion great interviewers on your own podcast. So thanks for tagging me for this. And uh, John, we love you, man. That's why we asked you. So great. Thank you. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before. <laughs>